Welcome to Season 2 of Garth and Sue Talk, a series by Psych Sessions where we bring up a topic of conversation and then we just riff. These are the water cooler conversations that you have with colleagues in your department. These are the chats you might have at the bar after a good day at a teaching conference. So please, pull up a seat as we talk about teaching. Ultimately, what I wonder is, does it come down to the quality of your rubric? And I could totally see if you're doing spec grading, you've got to be really clear in in your rubric. Mm -hmm. But if you're clear in your rubric otherwise, I don't know that it adds a whole lot. Well, I wanted to simplify my rubrics this year. And so I, Mm -hmm. instead of doing, um, because I was, even up till within the last year, I was, when I chose a question at not at random, but you know what I'm talking about. When I I chose a question, I was really breaking down. Did you identify the, this is a bad example based on our last conversation, but did you identify the independent variable? Did you identify the dependent? Did you give a nice example? And and each of those kind of had points associated with them. Mm -hmm. But I found like, oh man, this is really costing me a lot of time still Mm. uh, to Hmm. to go through these two questions like at that level. And so, um, and they were getting some right, but some wrong. And I, my, my rubric was not great for that. Um, anyway, so then I went to a, uh, for this question, this is going to be worth a 20 point question. Um, and did, did you answer in such a way that I think that, you know, it exceeds or meets or below? Um, and then I would give students kind of the ideal answer at the end. I'd kind of send that out to students. Um, which, which way do you do it? Do you do the more point by point kind of thing or do you do the more general understanding? Point by point. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know what I was talking about with that. Yeah. Because I am asked, even though I'm not entirely convinced that knowing the difference, being able to label independent and dependent variable is valuable. That's I, I have questions that are structured that way. No. So if the if the student correctly identifies it, great. If they get some part of it, then okay, partial credit, that's it. And so I'm just checking boxes on the rubric and then I might leave a comment if it's most, if I leave a comment, it's mostly for myself because I actually include the answers in the rubric. So, Oh, okay. Because I'm giving them the rubric afterward. It's a generic rubric. And then after I choose the questions, after they have submitted their final version, then I upload the rubric I'm actually going to use. So it says independent variable is this and, Oh no, you didn't get that right. So no box there. So, uh, very rarely do I leave comments. If I do, it's mostly to remind myself as to why the student get, didn't get full points for this. Because otherwise, the student can look and go like, okay, the rubric says independent variable is this. I didn't put that. All right, well, that's why I got it wrong. With an invitation to ask me for, in general comments, to ask me for more information if they had any questions about how their assignment was scored. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't feel like my my grading time is really long. Um, and what I could envision is if I moved to something like spec grading, it would just be, no, it didn't meet standard. Well, now I got to spend some time explaining to students why it didn't meet standard, right? Yeah. Um Yeah, I'm. <laughs> it's good. It brings up a bunch of questions for me. Like, um, unless you're revisiting, if that's the if that's the ultimate assessment of that particular, like if you don't have a comprehensive final exam or something, if that's the ultimate assessment, that's the last time they're going to see that thing. How much detailed feedback do they need? Especially if you've done any kind of formative assessment before that, and and it's not like you're asking them kind of out of the blue what is this thing they've seen it before they've had tools to clarify what it is they can they can ask peers they can ask you and now you're giving them uh you know uh, uh, you're giving them a grade on how much they got do they need that feedback um or 
as you and I know, we give tons of feedback and spend tons of time talking to students or, or giving feedback to students who never look at it. Is it better to give the, um, for example, I think this is why I went this way. Um, wow, exceeds standard, meets standard, below standard. And then students also know, which I know you do this too it's in some of your assignments. If you have questions specifically about it, let, let me know. Um, and so I, I think that that's why I've, I'm trying to think about why I've gone this this way is um, I, I've invited students to talk to me about those questions. I am giving those students feedback when they ask for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. And all of that sounds great. But I, if a student didn't meet standard on a particular question, and I don't have a detailed rubric for it, other than here are the, the general criteria that you need in order to demonstrate knowledge on this question, then it's just zero, no. And you can redo it if you want. But... Yeah, that's where you'd have to point them back to some awesome criteria that you've set out that says um, applies. I mean, I was talking to Jane a while ago, and we were talking about intro psych, and, and we, we kind of agreed that the thing, because we were talking about guidelines 3.0, and which I'm, I'm not a part of, um, but we were talking about like, what's the difference between the psych major and the intro psych student? And the difference is, or or what I guess what the question came out to was, uh, what should an intro psych student be able to do? And the question or the answer was apply. You should be able to apply these things to real life. That should be the thing. I wonder if there's a way, is there a way to build intro psych around that? Apply. Well, it is one of the APA, IPI, SLOs mm -hmm. is being able to apply Mm -hmm. um, oh, I have one more thing. Sorry, I know you're mid-thought. When you think about Bloom's taxonomy, I, I actually put this, I have a journal and I, I kind of wrote this out. And um, when you think about Bloom's taxonomy and if the taxonomy would reflect maybe uh, the development of, of psychological thinking or yeah, in a student throughout their, you know, to, to graduate school or something like that. Um. Where is intro psych on there? And, and really applies like the second one. It's like uh, the first one would be, can you, uh, can, can you um, maybe understand? No, not, that's not the, it's, it's something rote. It's more rote, right? Yeah. And then the yep. second one is apply. And that's why I was thinking about that. Sorry to cut you off, but. I don't know what I was going to say. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. You got excited. Yeah. I, 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 I hear that. Good for you. Um. <laughs> It's uh, so I think about I think about this, some of the discussions that we've had just within the department about where it is we how we see intro psych and what it is we want students to do in intro psych and within the department we have a general agreement that application is much more important than knowledge. So definitional questions on multiple choice exams are less favored. Application questions are more favored. And one of the reasons I don't like multiple choice exams is because <sighs> students have to have a lot of content memorized going into it. And I would rather have students spend some time with their book going, okay, I read about this classical conditioning stuff. It seemed to make sense to me. Now I have this brand new example my instructor has given me. Can I, can I map what's going on by, from what I read in the book and what was covered in lecture? Can I map that onto this new example? And students really have to exert some effort in doing it. And I would much rather that they have the resources at their disposal to actually work through that than to be caught blind by it, blindsided by it mm -hmm. on a multiple choice exam. Yeah. So I'm certainly down with the, with the application, but keeping in mind that 
students are not going to remember a lot of the terminology later. And that's what we were talking about earlier is I think as instructors, we get caught up in the terminology. We get caught up on the definitions and the margins. Students get caught up on the definitions and the margins and memorizing those and missing the, missing the bigger picture, which is why I'm really intrigued by this idea of completely redesigning the course around the integrative themes, given the integrative themes to students say, here's the chapter, find them. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that on a service level. Reading definitions in the margins is not gonna is not gonna get you there. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting to think about how you approach like um, even even content from a lecture perspective, and, and I mean lecture very loosely, right? But from a, from when you're in front of your classroom and you say um, today we are going to talk about um, whatever the topic is. Let's um, oh I don't know uh, stereotyping. I don't know, prejudice. We're going to talk about prejudice today in a social psych chapter. Um, And starting that way where, hey, today we're going to talk about prejudice and uh, here's what prejudice is. Um, It's That's really content centric, right? Uh, It's like, Mm -hmm. instead of saying, hey, you know that thing that happened uh, in our world uh, this week or, you know, I was in the grocery store and such and such and, and then telling the story that tell student what it, students what it is and it's really story based and applied primarily that becomes the the centerpiece and then uh, letting students in on what it was afterwards because we both know and we've heard enough people talk about this that students are not going to remember they are not going to remember uh, the, you know the definition of prejudice they are going to remember some amazing story that was emotional and uh, and and, and kind of got to a deeper level of processing for them. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it's crazy to me that our textbooks uh, or, or that our whole discipline has not gone in this. Di- well, maybe it's not that surprising to me, but I, I guess I'm, I'm interested to see will any textbook blow up at what point will they blow up the box uh, to embrace the, the themes? Cause that would cost them lots of people won't want to go there. They won't. And that's the They're going to try to squeeze it in. They're just going to try to yeah. squeeze it into existing model. That's what's going to happen first. Yeah. So it's going to be, let's integrate the themes into the book. We'll, we'll squeeze it, shoehorn it in. And no, it's not going to be pretty, but it'll be there. And then somebody who has really taken to the themes and is so inclined will say, you know what? What we need is a textbook that is written from the themes perspective so that each chapter is really a theme. Mm-hmm. And but then you're to my be, model, right? Then you're to my model where you're pulling things in from different parts of psychology, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and it would look very, very different. It would look very, very different. Whew. Yeah. And no, the, the old fogies like us are less likely to be the ones who would move to that model. Yeah. But the, the new instructors coming out of graduate school right now, I could see them, they're, they're malleable enough that they might grab a hold of something like that. Yeah. I can already, can I, even though, go ahead. I, I should give a shout out to Carol Wade and Carol Tavares, because if I'm remembering correctly, they had a textbook that was not based on themes, but it was, but it was close. It was, um, it was written from the, the different pillars. Of course, it wasn't called pillars then when they wrote it. So there was a, a whole cognitive section and a whole biological section, a whole social section. Yeah. So it really zoomed out and and looked at the bigger picture of psychology. Do you know if but that within, was was that their flagship? Those five disciplines. Was that their main title or was it a kind of an offshoot like you know how like Myers or whoever has like multiple books? I don't remember. Okay. This was this was 20 years ago, easy, 25 years ago, something uh-huh. like that. I was going to say, it causes me some anxiety to think about teaching it <laughs> in a new way because you're right. We are, especially one of us is older. Um, 
<laughs> we are old One fogies, of us is. right? We are. We are. But we and and even as as non traditional as we think we are, it would be hard if a younger person came up and said, "Let's just blow this up," you know, and <laughs> let's let's re let's rewrite the whole thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to be a part of that. You know. All right. Let's well, do it. Let's do it. <laughs> next summer. I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Are we doing anything next summer? I don't know. Are Do you feel like, do you have the energy at this stage in your career? Do you have the energy for like redoing entire courses and rethinking through that? Is that energizing to you? And I'm not saying I, I we'll get off the old joke here because you're not that old. Uh, but but you are a veteran and you've been doing this for a long time and your students are doing well in your courses, like you're teaching well. Uh, what's the incentive to pull a course apart and, and try it a new way at this point? It can be invigorating. Mm-hmm. It, it absolutely can be. And the, the old course isn't going anywhere. Like I could, I could do this new thing if it totally flops. I'm like, all right, well, that totally didn't work. And I hop right back into my old way of doing things. But, but thinking of teaching in a different way is, is absolutely invigorating. I was late mid-career when I switched to inner teaching. And I'm like, this is fantastic. This, yeah. is, this is really good for me. And I could totally see teaching from an integrative theme perspective as I watch students pull out these themes and in doing, in doing that in ways that I would have never imagined, I can imagine that being incredibly invigorating. And knowing that students are walking away from the course knowing those seven themes, um, that, would be, that would be fantastic. So the course content, the course content is staying the same. I think there are always going to be neurons and there's always going to be classical conditioning and there's always going to be memory. It's, it's the angle from which it is taught that can change. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, Sue, um, it looks like we have another episode in our pocket here and uh, thanks for uh, the thoughtful conversation. Always a pleasure, Garth, except for that one time. <laughs>